Good evening, everyone, everyone online and everyone here in the studio. I'm Adrian Moore. I'm Vice President of Policy at the Reason Foundation, and I'm joined by Carl DeMaio, who's uh, made a career out of government reform, most recently uh, serving on the San Diego City Council and running for mayor in San Diego. And we're going to talk some tonight about uh, issues, issues in California and specifically about uh, pension issues, government uh, pension issues in California. Uh, we've started something here at Reason we call the California Reform Initiative. Uh, we have this crazy idea that maybe uh, even California can be turned around and even California can be saved from, uh, uh, in a sense, the ravages of, of over-large government. Um, I, and I, so I guess my first question, Carl, is, do you, is how crazy is that? Do you think California can be saved? Absolutely. Uh, we're quickly running out of money in the state of California. We've been running out of jobs by driving uh, investment and businesses out of our state. We've run out of services and infrastructure, and we're quickly running out of time. And so it can be turned around. California can be saved, but it requires immediate action uh, and a commitment by our political leaders to actually make serious structural reform. Not transactional reform, but transformational reform. Rethinking how we operate as a state. Uh, rethinking how we create conditions where people want to move to California, want to raise a family. They want to start that first business. They want to invest. They want to hire that first employee. They want to hire that 15th employee. And so those issues can be addressed if we have a real and genuine commitment by political leaders to do the right thing. And that's what the project's about. The project's about generating bold ideas on how to solve California's looming challenges. It's about raising public awareness so that Californians know that they don't have to accept a failed state, that we don't have to accept the fate of higher taxes, more regulation, and less services, a diminished quality of life. Uh, and that they can be part of the solution, that the people can take back control of their government, whether it's their local government at City Hall or whether it's their state government in Sacramento, and position our, our state uh, for success again. So it's going to involve, uh, I think, not only the idea generation uh, in, in a number of areas, but it's going to involve uh, a, a public education, a public mobilization process uh, to put pressure on political leaders to take uh, action on reform? Well, there's a lot of issues where I think any individual online or in the audience could say, oh, I think California needs to fix this, or, I, you know, there's a lot of potential worst problems in California. I think you and I have agreed that, uh, that the government pension problems and the unsustainability of the benefits that have been promised and the inadequacy of the uh, investments that are being made to pay for those benefits is a tangible, immediate problem that not only has to be addressed, but probably uh, can be addressed if enough people sort of realize the scope of the problem and the potential solution. So I want to get into that a little bit. And uh, I guess the starting point is most people have no idea really. They may have heard government pensions are a problem, but they don't know how big it is, how big it is nationwide and how big it is in California. So could you explain that a little bit? Sure. The government pension crisis across the country is a three trillion dollar crisis using today's numbers, using what we know today, three trillion dollars. And to put that in perspective, you would have to pass six tax bills that we just passed in January, the, the big tax increase in Washington, six of those bills to pay for the three trillion dollars over the next 10 years. In the state of California, you're talking about roughly $500 billion in debt, $500 billion in liabilities. Uh, those are big numbers, a billion here, a trillion there. But let's really point out the impact to people's lives day to day. What it means is higher taxes, higher water bills, because most of our water is delivered by government systems. It means less services. It means a commute in the morning that is clogged uh, with uh, potholes. Uh, it means uh, uh, less after-school programs for our children. Go down the list of things that people look to government to be at least involved in, if not providing, and you will find 
that these programs have been cut back year after year after year. And yet government's collecting more and more money year after year after year. So we're spending more and we're getting less. And that's really the, uh, I think the, the, the best uh, way to show the impact of pension uh, costs that are skyrocketing um, will be the loss of services that we've seen in the past decade and the higher cost of living, higher cost of operating in every loca location in, in the state of California, city, county, and of course the state government. Um, if you don't reform government pensions, no tax increase is going to be big enough. No service cut will be deep enough to avoid bankruptcy. You can continue to raise taxes. You can continue to gut services. And we will still be bankrupt. And that's why this is the most important issue to start with. And I also believe that by solving the pension crisis, we will build capacity. We will build public trust and participation. We will build a governing majority that will allow us to tackle other issues down the line. You know, you get pensions reformed, then let's turn and look at other areas of waste in government. Can we open up government services to outsourcing and competition? Can we look at public-private partnerships? Can we look at decentralizing services to a, a local level? Can we embrace technology to deliver services and to interact as citizens in a dramatically different way? Those are easy challenges. Uh, if you can overcome the resistance to pension reform, the government employee unions, the fact that the politicians and the judges benefit from these pensions themselves, if you can overcome that, many of these other issues are uh, much more um, uh, are more easily accomplished because you have success at your back and you have uh, really overcome perhaps the biggest obstacle to reform in the state. Well, I first really realized myself how severe the government pension problem was when on, for, in order to write a column for my local newspaper, I had to calculate the fire department pension costs into the future. And what I realized that is that by the time my first kid graduates from college, the fire department in my community will be paying more money per year to retired workers than they will be to people who are actually working then. And, and so you know, nothing could be more unsustainable than a system where you're, over time you're paying more and more people who are not working and fewer and fewer people who are working. Uh, that system's just going to collapse. Uh, so I want to break down a little bit how we got into that pickle. And, and what, I, what I hear a lot, and I think represents sort of the common views, is that is this a question of the, that the government has just set benefits too high, or is it that, they, uh, that the benefits are reasonable, but they're simply not putting enough into the investment funds that are supposed to pay for those benefits on investment returns down the line, or is it some combination of the two? Well, if you listen to the people who are trying to defend the status quo, the government employee unions, they'll say there is no crisis. That if you just pump a little bit more money in, and we have a couple more investment gains if the stock market does a bit better, that all will be well. It's sort of like that uh, uh, gambling addict who thinks that if they just could get one more buy-in on the poker table, that they will get that perfect hand, and they'll be able to get on that winning streak. Uh, it's simply not sustainable. It's not been the investment losses. It's not been uh, intentional underfunding, although that has occurred in these pension systems. It's been the spike in benefits. It's promising too much. Uh, we have low retirement ages, age 50 for public safety in most jurisdictions, 55 for everyone else. That's the retirement age in government. 55, you should be done. You should be in Tahoe. You should be in Maui, age 55. Now, I know a lot of hardworking taxpayers out there who look at age 65, 67, 70, and are wondering whether they can actually afford retirement at those ages because of the cost of government, because of the taxation, because of the burdens uh, in the private sector. And so there's a, there is an inequity in terms of the benefit that's offered. We see many government employees retiring, earning more in pension payouts in their first year than their highest salary working. Now, you know it's a government idea when you're paid more not to work than you were actually paid to work. And a lot of these pension systems have benefits that allow government employees to earn more in their first year of pension payouts than in the highest year of salary. We had a study done in San Diego uh, 
where I asked uh, the Mercer Actuarial Company, what does the average city employee get if they have 30-year service? The answer was the average city employee, 30-year service, not police and fire, we're talking about a blue-collar or white-collar employee, will receive 129% of their highest salary for life. 129%. And we have a number of other uh, abuses in the system. Uh, for example, in San Diego, uh, individuals are allowed to retire in place. And during the last five years of their employment with the city, they enter a program called DROP, Deferred Retirement Option Plan, where they receive not only a full salary, but they receive a full pension simultaneously. And these DROP pensions, or we call double dippers, um, they are able to then retire and receive their base pension, plus a 25-year annuity funded off of the drop proceeds. So you keep peeling back the onion and you find abuses. Pensions are calculated not on the last salary, regular salary, but they are calculated based on all compensation. Bonus pay, add-on pay, specialty pay, vacation pay, sick pay, to spike that pension calculation. In the city of San Diego, we had uh, 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 an example of innovation where our parking meters uh, used to have uh, attendants going around on foot, giving tickets and checking the meters. Well, in the uh, uh, past decade, uh, the city decided to get scooters. And these scooters were given to the employees, and the idea was that we would make this investment make our employees more efficient, they can get around quicker, put those tickets on the cars quicker, and it would be an easier work environment for them because they're not walking, they actually are just driving a scooter. The union said, thank you very much, we appreciate this uh, device, but you know it takes a very talented person to drive a scooter. And as a result, we believe our employees should receive scooter pay. <laughs> scooter pay is about 5% bonus pay annually. Now, for some of the unions, these people receive scooter pay even when they're not driving the scooter. If you're on vacation, you get scooter pay on vacation. And of course, when you retire, you get your scooter pay added to your right. to final compensation. So, you know, you can't make this stuff up. In the private sector, it just doesn't happen. So when people say, well, what's the real root of the pension crisis? Is it the investment losses? Uh, is it that we didn't pay enough into the system? You know, that's happened. But the real driver has been an unsustainable system of benefits that promises too much, that promises a level of benefit that no taxpayer receives themselves that are being asked to foot the bill. You don't see this happening in the private sector or the nonprofit sector. You see it happening in government. And I think really more than just the financial cost savings of pension reform, and we're talking billions of dollars of savings, savings that can be put back into programs and reducing the cost of government. The real issue here is fairness and equity. Why should we have a governing class receive a better benefit than the people they are supposed to serve, than the hardworking taxpayers that are footing the bill? And might I add that the politicians typically receive the sweetest, the best benefits. In the city of San Diego, when we did an examination of benefit payouts, we found that our youngest pensioner started earning his pension at age 31. I was shocked. How can someone at age 31 receive a pension? Well, it was a city council member who was convicted of a felony and ejected from office and, of course, automatically started receiving a pension on day one after the conviction. <laughs> and. That's because the city council members, the politicians, set their retirement age at zero. They start receiving their pension immediately, immediately upon leaving office. We see other politicians that have left the city council after eight years of service. Uh, they are termed out. Then they go get elected to the state assembly or the state senate. They receive a pension and a taxpayer salary simultaneously. And so the politicians themselves have reserved some of the best benefits uh, for their class. And so there's this secret society. No one wants to reform because if you reform one side, ultimately the gig is up for everyone. The dominoes fall. <laughs> well, there's nothing more to be said then about why reform is so hard to happen. <laughs> when well, the hard. prime beneficiaries are the very ones who have to execute the reform, uh, you, you've got a huge problem. 
Well, before we, I want to talk a little bit about actually how we do reform and what you guys did in, in San Diego. But before, just to go back, you, you, you mentioned that you didn't think there was that much deliberate failure to save and to invest adequately in order to pay for these benefits. I'm not so sanguine about it. I think, uh, I, I think a lot of city councils have accepted reports from staff projecting fantastic market returns for their pension plans that n none of them would accept from their broker with their own personal investments. And, and then they've doubled down on this. I mean, most people have not heard of this insidious thing called a pension obligation bond. This is where the government says, oh my gosh, we don't have enough money this year. We're supposed to pay, let's say, the city of X is supposed to pay $150 million this year into the pension fund in order to have enough years down the road to pay for benefits. We don't have $150 million because we just gave big raises and we hired a bunch of people and we started a new program and, and et cetera, et cetera. So well, I know we'll sell some bonds. So we'll borrow the money to pay for a future debt. So we'll double down on the debt with, with double interest compounded. And uh, this has become a common practice now in California. Absolutely. And, and, but again, you see that happening. It's a major problem. But the root cause of all of that continues to be promises that cannot be sustained. Benefits that we would never see in the private sector because business owners, uh, the private sector executives, nonprofit managers, know that if they were to give these benefits away, they'd go bankrupt and they'd probably go to jail. In the, in the government sector, you have seen uh, two things happen uh, to try to mask the debt. One is they use rosy scenarios on investment returns and rosy uh, scenarios on uh, liabilities. So they are assuming 8%, 7.5% guaranteed annual return on investment every year for 30 years, in each and every year. Now, if you can make 8% a year or 7.5% a year guaranteed every year for 30 years, I'm giving you my money right now. <laughs> Uh, and so there are rosy scenarios. In the city of San Diego, we also have a policy called surplus earnings. Now, in a defined benefit plan, I don't know how you could have something called surplus <laughs> earnings <laughs> because in good years, you should keep your surplus earnings, your investment gains for years where you're naturally going to have a market downturn so that you average out to a stable rate of return. Well, in the city of San Diego, we give our retirees a 13th check to pay out those surplus earnings. So it's a very abusive system. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the so pension... So they get all the upside and the taxpayers get all the downside. The pension obligation <laughs> bonds. Uh, the pension obligation bonds, uh, again, is, is paying one credit card with another. Right. And uh, these came into to, uh, use in the 1980s uh, where uh, politicians would say, well, not only are we cash poor, but I think we can beat the market. You know, we're only going to pay 5%, 6%. 4% on the pension obligation bond because it's a, uh, a municipal bond. Uh, and we believe that we can get better than 8%. Maybe we get 9% return this year. Maybe we get 10%. And so we can actually make some money and put that money into paying down our liability. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the Government Finance Officers Association, which you know tends to look at things from a government point of view, even they had to admit, this is like a poker player going to a loan shark to double down on his last hand. No, I think it's actually worse than that. It's like me going to my credit union where I can get a low interest personal loan in order to invest in the stock market because I believe that I can beat my loan interest rate with my stock market gains. I mean, if that worked, who needs capitalism? Right. We could all just be rich. Just, it's, just a, it's a sweet little uh, turnaround. And, and it doesn't work. You, br you brought up jail. And, and I, I've thought of this a number of times when I look at this. If any private sector CEO or board of directors uh, made pay decisions for their employees uh, based on their what they expected to come in the coming year and predicted revenues and expenses for the coming year and failed so abjectly both in terms of uh, the return on the benefits and the return on the investments so that they lost money, they would be turfed right out by the stockholders of that company. And yet we've got city government after county government after state government here that makes that mistake over and over again. Nobody even knows. Well, we only have a little while left, so I do want to talk about reforms because we've, we've said enough about how big the problem is, I think. Uh, in San Diego, right now, San Diego is probably the brightest and most shining example of what 
can be done in pension reform. There's a long ways to go, obviously, to get through uh, uh, executing all of those reforms. But can you talk just a little bit about what did you guys change sure. in San Diego and maybe a little bit about what was, other than the obvious, the unions, the biggest barrier you were up against? First, we closed our pension system and decided that we would give our city employees the same benefits that taxpayers receive, Social Security and a 401k. Uh, and we benchmarked it to the penny against what the Department of Labor has measured in San Diego County is the average contribution that an employer provides for a 401k. So to the penny, it's dollar for dollar equality. Uh, and that also requires that we pay our bill when it's due, we, that we pay a defined contribution each and every year, and that there's no hidden liability that bites taxpayers down the line. Second, we are the only system that figured out how to reform existing government employee pensions. And I really, if, if you walk away with only one bit of information out of this webinar, know that pensions for existing employees can be reformed. Now the politicians and the government unions will want you to believe that that's all set in stone, that there's no way to reform it. But we have shown in San Diego that there are many ways to reform it. First and foremost, we decided, hey, we may not be able to change the formulas and the benefits directly, but we can charge you 100% of your fair contribution for the benefit. Amazing thing happens when you charge someone the cost of a Cadillac. They start asking about the Yugo. Uh, they want a more affordable model. And so that leads to the second reform, which is you may not be able to force someone out of a vested contract, but you can enter into an amendment to that contract on a voluntary basis. And so we allow under our ballot measure people to opt out of defined benefit plans into 401k plans on a go-forward basis. Why would they want to do that? Because they wouldn't be paying the high contribution rate each and every year that we mandate. And third, pensions are based on a formula. You get your years of service times a multiplier. It's 3% in the city for police and fire at age 50, 2.5% per year for everyone else at age 55. Can't change that multiplier, but it's multiplied by your last salary, your highest salary. What we decided to do was change what that last salary would be. We said that it would only be based on the base salary, no, no bonus pays and specialty pays, so the scooter pay, sayonara, <laughs> it's gone. And second of all, we froze the assumed increase in pay. Government employees under the City of San Diego model were assumed to receive a guaranteed 5% increase in their compensation each and every year. Automatic increase in compensation. What I said was, well, what would happen if we flatlined at zero? If you flatline at zero, your liability drops, particularly over a 30-year period, over a 15-year period, over a five-year period, and your annual payment therefore drops as well. And the payout for that employee would be also lower, more conservative, more reasonable when they retire. So we froze pensionable pay calculations for five years. Uh, combined, this ballot measure saves one to two billion dollars under the most conservative cost saving estimates. And it's really a philosophical change in employee compensation under the rule that you should receive no more, no less than the labor market that you operate in, than the hardworking taxpayers themselves receive. And when people said that the politics would never allow for this, that we were you know, going to have the unions come in, uh, we understood that the unions were going to oppose. But we felt that if we could get this to a public vote and have the people decide that they would agree. The city of San Diego voting demographics are the same as the state of California, plus or minus 1% on every demographic. The same number of de Democrats, Republicans, Independents. Republicans are a third party in the city of San Diego. And so we put this measure on the ballot and it carried every political party. It carried every council district, every socioeconomic group, including Latinos and African Americans and Asians. It is such a no-brainer that we need pension reform, that if we could get this on the ballot in the state of California, uh, that it would pass overwhelmingly and reform would be achieved. So the question is, how do we overcome the barriers? How do we overcome the labor unions? And that really is up to uh, the efforts uh, in the next year, 18 months, of educating the public, shining a light on the problem, exposing the real cost and the liability, but also translating it really into a fairness argument. 
why should you pay more in taxes so that we have a librarian in San Diego walk out with a $234,000 a year annual pension? Why should you have cuts in your after school programs? Or why should your pothole not be filled? Or why should you not be able to get a first responder to your home in the national response time or better so that we can have a 45% increase in the number of six-figure pensions, which we've seen happen in the state of California over the past two years. So when you put it in those, pers th those terms, uh, you can easily build a majority case in the state of California in the people uh, who matter, who can actually make a difference, and I don't believe that's the politicians. It's the voting public. It's the, the general polls. public that we have to be able to reach and educate. And it's not just San Diego. Uh, San Jose also passed pretty substantial, not as quite as bold as San Diego's, but pretty substantial reforms. A few other communities like Bakersfield have passed uh, more modest but very meaningful reforms, uh, getting employees to retire at a more reasonable time to contribute more to their pension benefits and to change the formulas for new employees so they don't get these over-the-top benefits, reining it all in. So there's a m bit of a move afoot. And I think, uh, as Carl said, if, if, if we can get this going statewide, we can have a huge impact on California's fiscal situation. We have just a few moments left, a few minutes left, sorry. Uh, and I want to uh, turn to our studio audience and uh, see if we have any questions uh, on this or related issues uh, from them. Uh, talking about reform, I, I like your ideas. What about um, the people that are already retired? Short of bankruptcy, is that pretty much a lack? Well, for, for individuals that have already retired, it's very difficult to reform benefits. And so we've always said there are three classes or three um, opportunities for reform. There's new employees, which should be a no-brainer. We ought to be doing that yesterday. There's existing employees. Uh, you can implement reforms as we've done in San Diego to slowly reduce the debt and slowly reduce your annual uh, cost of pensions. But for people already retired, legally, there are we haven't found any options right now. Uh, and uh, even in bankruptcy in the state of California, the state constitution presumably provides an ironclad guarantee for vested benefits, particularly for people who are already retired. So we have focused on the first two areas employees and existing employees, and I believe that you are able to fix the financial crisis and pensions with just those two classes. Is it fair? No, it's not. Because there are a lot of six-figure pensioners that are out there. There's that ex-politician earning uh, a pension starting at age 31. But as much as we'd like to change that, the law does not allow us to do that. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we are implementing reforms that stand up in court get those locked in immediately, and then see if we can address some of the uh, structural problems with the existing retirees. I think there's also a fairness argument for the vast majority of employees. Uh, many of them earn, uh, uh, you know, who, particularly who retired prior to, to 2000 in the state of California, before benefits were spiked by many ju jurisdictions. They earn modest pensions. And in fact, their retirement security is threatened by all these new benefits that have been voted in. And so there's a sense of equity that people have already retired. Uh, let's, try, let's try to uh, facilitate uh, and protect uh, and, and reform the system um, uh, and avoid bankruptcy for those individuals. Carl, when you're talking about making a change at the state level, um, getting something on the state ballot, how does that impact the other municipalities? Uh, can the state mandate how a city calculates the retirement benefits? Uh, the answer is yes, the state constitution can put in place reforms on both state and local uh, governments. Um, the concern I've always had is that the state legislature has been going the opposite direction. They're always passing bills that make it uh, more costly and more generous for these pensions. And so by moving it through the initiative process and putting this in the hands of the people, there's an opportunity to reset the clock statewide. The reason uh, why statewide reform is also necessary is that you don't want to have competition problems where San Diego reforms its pension system and then a neighboring city like Chula Vista or Escondido, uh, they decide to continue with an unsustainable system 
and they're able to attract uh, employees away on the basis of promises that will never be kept. Uh, we want to see if we can reset the entire playing field all at once, and a statewide initiative would be the best way to do that. I think the, uh, <clears throat> a lot of local governments use the state pension fund as well. So the local governments still set the benefit levels that they promise to their employees, but in terms of making the investments and, and, and allegedly saving the money to pay off those benefits, they use the state system. So a statewide reform would trickle down through that anyway by, by taking away the option of local governments to assume ridiculous uh, market returns as they currently do. And what lessons can be learned from your experience with the unions in San Diego that would help at the statewide level? It seems like you guys were rather successful and how is that going to translate into working with a, at the state level? First, uh, the biggest lesson uh, was that as bad as you think it's going to be to face the unions and the opposition tactics that they're going to use, it will be far worse. <laughs> I never imagined what they would do to try to stop our pension reform initiative. Um, they knew that if we got this qualified and put it on the ballot that it would pass overwhelmingly. So what they decided to do was um, try to disrupt the constitutional right of the initiative process itself by blocking signature gatherers uh, from collecting signatures and intimidating people working on the campaign, intimidating members of the public who were interested in signing the ballot measure. They took out an ad during the period of time when we were collecting signatures on radio warning people that if they signed a ballot measure, their identity would be stolen and sold to India. <laughs> I guess India is a scary place, yeah. <laughs> but, but it was the scare tactics, it was the intimidation, the lies um, that it was pretty shocking. I didn't think they would go that far, but um, if we do this statewide, uh, just recognize that it will be a battle royale. Here in Los Angeles, uh, former Mayor uh, Dick Reardon uh, sponsored a pension reform initiative to go to, I believe, a 401k-like system for the city of Los Angeles, which is also facing a fiscal crisis. Um, he encountered the same resistance, the intimidation, the blocking efforts, the uh, protests, and as a result, his signature uh, drive fell short. Uh, he had to discontinue it. So. Um, this will be a full-on campaign from the moment it is filed, the moment people try qualifying this initiative, because the unions know that once this is put on the ballot, once people are allowed to vote on reform, it will pass overwhelmingly. No amount of campaign money that they put into a campaign against the measure will succeed because people recognize we're in a crisis and we need to make reform. Well, we're a little, uh, a little over time, so uh, we're going to have to stop here. Uh, I want to thank again everyone watching online and thank our studio audience. And most of all, I want to thank Carl uh, for the work he's done so far and for joining Team Reason. Absolutely. Excited about it. <laughs>